Okay, what is up, Yardies? We are back. Welcome back. Today, today we're going to be taking a look at Christmas movies. This is our Christmas special. As you can see, I got the tree up in the back. Got a couple of presents started under it already. Yes, Corky is one of the presents. He's a gift every day. For the people listening, I just winked. So, Christmas movies. Let me get a little sip of the coffee here. <sighs> Let's jump right into it. Christmas movies. Welcome to the Christmas special. Welcome to the Backyard Variety Tour Christmas special. And we're talking rare Christmas movies. I'm not going to go through Christmas movies that you're all going to watch anyways. Everyone's watching Home Alone and Die Hard and Elf. But you don't need me to tell you to watch that stuff. You're already going to do it. So I'm giving you hints at some other ones that might fill a little bit of void, Christmas void, if you're looking for a different style of Christmas movie. Lethal Weapon. You can find this on Crave TV. It's made in 1987. Now this is an L.A. Christmas. It's going to be Xmas through music, set decorations, Christmas trees, Christmas lights, no snow. Unless we're talking about cocaine. It's going to fall in line with those other L.A. Christmas movies like Die Hard, where it's metaphorical Christmas to an extent. You know, basically trees and basically just everything, all the Christmas elements except snow. Now, Lethal Weapon, I gotta say, is a really good movie. And so is number two, actually. Number two might have actually even be more polished and better than the first, but number one is very good ultra good actually and the weird thing is is because when i was growing up going to movies i was at the right age when lethal weapon three and four were coming out and those were bombs and bust not to a 13 year old who thought <laughs> joe pesci <laughs> chris rock <laughs> not to the, not to me but looking back yes they were and really one and two are where it's at and i can't recall if number two is really a christmas movie but at least one is yeah so the thing about lethal weapon is that it's actually an action-packed killer christmas like right off the bat it's shane black who writes it he always starts it off with kind of a bang in a way so you got this half-naked girl you know leaping off committing suicide leaping off a balcony and it all kind of stems from there it's the same as his uh, in the nice guys I think it's a, a girl crashes in her car it's like a half-naked girl crashes in her car or something like that Shane Black is a really good action crime writer yeah so some of the scenes where you're gonna see Christmas really play out visually anyways is when he's at the Christmas trees buying cocaine kind of near the beginning and then another one I love I actually love the lighting of this one and it makes no sense. It makes no sense that the lighting would be all red. Almost looks like a Scorsese lighting setup. So it's all red. They're next to a Christmas tree that has multiple different colored lights on it. But for some reason, red is dominating. And for some reason, it doesn't matter because the shot looks so good. But it's basically Riggs and Murtaugh um, planning, contemplating what they're going to do for the big desert heist scene that's going to come up. Big uh, desert shootout scene that's going to come up next. You're going to love those dark scenes lit by red Christmas lights. I'm too old for this shit. Isn't Murtaugh always like a day away from retirement? I'm too old for this. So it's your typical buddy cop movie. You know, one guy's black, one guy's white. Riggs and Murtaugh. And actually, Riggs and Murtaugh is the name of a chocolate vanilla shake from the Burgers Priest. That's actually pretty good too. But it's your typical buddy cop scenario odd couple you know one guy's like an older vet and one guy's a suicidal rookie great movie though reindeer games prime video 1999 this is an underrated classic by a great director too john frankenheimer this guy directed the manchurian candidate not the remake the original basically so reindeer games is basically ben affleck and it's a, a casino robbery it's a crime movie, casino robbery, they dress as Santa Claus. So it's basically a better version of 3,000 Miles to Graceland, where they dress up as Elvis, you know. Um, it's a better version of that. And I don't know which, I'll have to look up to see which one came first. But Reindeer Games, you got the great Dennis Farina. Dennis Farina is the best guy. He used to be a Chicago police officer and turned it into an acting career. 
and he plays cops. He plays some of the best characters, supporting characters, in in film history. I was just watching a, a Dinner for Five that he was on, and I think it's because he, even in comedies he plays it hard boiled and serious, like in Get Shorty and other things. He's not playing it for laughs; he's playing it serious, and they get laughs. So he's really great. I love the line that he has. They all, they keep talking about the powwow safe at the Tomahawk Casino, and at the very end, Ben Affleck's like pow wow and Dennis Farina turns around with the Uzis and just starts shooting the place up pow wow but Reindeer Games is pretty good for kind of a cheesy little cheesy it's still got a little cheese but it's pretty good it's pretty good it holds up as like an entertaining 90s action flick in the great year of 99 again it's on Prime Video so it's full of twists and turns you know you got Charlize Theron she just gets naked in a pool at one point you got, uh, but she's actually a really good actor in it too. It shows some of her acting chops for sure. Um, you can see where she further developed, in, like in Monster, where she actually has acting chops. So she's good in this. Great supporting cast: Gary Sinise, Danny Trejo, Donald Logue. So yeah, it's a solid action flick. Tons of twists and turns. I say there's about three twists and turns in it. It takes that you don't, you know, no matter how cheesy they may be, you don't necessarily see them coming. And they're not that cheesy. There's like, maybe the one at the end is a little cheesy. But it's more so the whistling, I think, is cheesy. So Gary Sinise plays a badass named Monster. <laughs> he runs this crime gang, Monster. And they're always like, Duh, Monster, what do you think? And he's like, Meow. that's my Gary Sinise impression. What do you think, convict? Oh yeah, and the hilarious thing about this this crime ring that Gary Sinise runs is they travel around in a transport truck. So like a couple guys sit up front, like Gary Sinise and one of the drivers, and they chat up front while the rest of them sit in the back of the transport. It's hilarious. And they're just like driving, plowing through the snow in this giant transport. The thing I love about this movie actually is the great camera work and great camera angles. There's a ton of Dutch angles. Um, you know, which are a lot of fun in, in a movie like this. Um, Dutch angles and extreme close-ups, very extreme close-ups, very interesting. It's almost like a Western, how close they get. Very Sergio Leone, how close they get in the close-ups, like extreme, like they're right. It's basically the entire frame. It's like if this whole frame fit my entire head. And almost just from like middle of the forehead to like chin. They really get in there on the eyes and the face. Oh yeah, the pecan pie scene. Check, out, check it out for the pecan pie scene. It's so stupid and hilarious. Uh, I won't get into more details than that, but just the pecan pie. You have to wait for it. And another, <laughs> another great scene. Ben Affleck, kind of near the end. So it's kind of near the end, the crime ring, the plants all together. They're all dressed like Santa, or they're getting ready to dress like Santa. But before they do the final sting, they want to send Ben Affleck in, who apparently knows this casino and knows where the safe is and everything. But he's like, oh, they know me. I got to dress up as like a character. I got to dress up as someone so they don't recognize me. So he dresses up in this like Texan outfit with this hilarious mustache, big cowboy hat, like a Texas rancher, does an accent. And then at one point, Ashton Kutcher pops up into the movie for like two minutes. I would say and he's a guy gambling at the casino and then I'm pretty sure he gets his ass kicked he's like in the washroom at one point Ben Affleck switches clothes with him and then I think Kutcher goes out and like gets thrown in the snow or something like that by the real bad guys who thought he was Ben Affleck anyways it's kind of hilarious just to see Ashton Kutcher pop up in this movie he's got a goatee it's weird this one normally kind of flew under the radar a bit more although this year I've been seeing it pop up in everybody's list a ton so it's out there now and that's Batman Returns Crave TV 1992. So basically, there's tons of snow in this movie because it's in Gotham, which is basically New York. So it's full of snow, full of driving scenes where you see the snow. Um, basically, they have a big, uh, basically not even close to what the Rockefeller tree would be because it's kind of like a smaller set, but it, that's just basically the idea of of Gotham, the Rockefeller tree in Gotham there. And it's basically like a big set piece for them. They're at that press conference tree like three or four times throughout the movie for like, you know, 10 or something minutes each, which is a long time. So that's a huge set piece. They filmed almost the whole movie there once you break it up. 
probably accounts for like 40 minutes of the movie, 45 minutes of the movie at that one set piece. Yeah, but you know, there's Christmas shopping on the streets. Um, the city storefronts are all decorated with Christmas stuff. So that's where the, the snow and the Christmas and all the decorations, it's a Christmas movie. It takes place during the holiday season. So yeah, so Alfred decorates a tree while Bruce watches the penguins presser in moody Christmas lighting. Um, penguin uses a stocking as a prop to pull a severed hand and toxic waste out of. At one point, there's a baby in a little Santa costume that gets stolen and used as a prop for the penguin to look like a hero in a staged presser event. Driving in the snow at the end and picking up the cat in the alley to take it. Everything's in black while snow is falling. That looks really, looks really good. I love that little portion of the movie, like 15, 20 seconds, 30 seconds. He's driving in the car, he's all in black, tells Alfred to stop, gets out in the alley, thinks he sees Catwoman or whatever, sees a black cat, just the snow is just pouring down. It looks, you know, snow looks, when it's pouring down like that, snow looks great on film. And the last line of the movie, Merry Christmas, Master Wayne. Merry Christmas, Alfred. And goodwill to all men. And women. Batman returns, and everybody, you gotta love that part. It's actually really disgusting. That movie's fucking disgusting. Danny DeVito is disgusting. The way he eats. <laughs> like, l watching him eat, just looking at him, is disgusting. When he bites that guy's nose off, I remember that creeping me out. It's more hilarious now. I find it more funny now. That must have taken a lot of work to get Danny DeVito into that suit and all the makeup and everything. Now we're getting into one of my favorites. This is just, this is not just a Christmas movie, but an all-time favorite movie of mine, Eyes Wide Shut. You can watch this on Crave TV. It's from 1999. Really strange Christmas movie. Basically about New York, but filmed on a London soundstage. So um, I just love, I love the lighting choices of this movie. It's a really nice touch of mixing all the colors, like blue and yellow, foreground and background. Kubrick just, how they make this look is just incredible. The lighting in it is really amazing. Um, not to have it, not to mention having the best stars and and all that. I think Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman might have been married at the time. And something happened with this movie where they finished it. Something happened, and then they had to come back for reshoots. Christmas lights, decorations, set decorations everywhere. All the storefronts in their house, the tree, everything. It's a Christmas movie. So, but it's a creepy movie, thrilling at times and mysterious at times and suspenseful at times too. If you're sitting there, if you sit and watch this movie, if you put your phone down and you're not looking at your phone every 15 minutes, if you sit and watch this movie, you'll get creepy, thrilling, mysterious suspense. This movie's good. The piano. Ting. 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 As he thinks he's being followed or is he being followed? Is it all in his head? You know, all that, it's crazy. It hits all the right notes. Speaking of piano, it hits all the right notes. There is that piano playing aspect to it as well because actually his friend, Nick Nightingale, is a piano player and plays pianos at the orgy parties, which we'll get into. And it basically lands, a, there's another segue. So it lands a hand, all those rumors of rich, elite, and powerful people throwing these parties sex parties now in this movie there's no kids nothing like that it's all adults but it's just a massive orgy party and um kind of by the end you find out there's like you know it's all rich people i mean where they have it is this mad one of the biggest houses you've ever seen in your life it fucking has a big i don't even know why the hell it has that room that they're in other than for like cult sacrifices and shit like that if you think about it so um yeah, so it lends a hand to those parties and, and how much money these people have and how far they will go to cover it up. And this isn't covering it up like fucking Matt Damon or something that's running around and people are chasing him in the streets or enemy of the state, cover it up. It's like the government's chasing people in the streets like fucking Karate Kid with the mask, like that quote from Social Network. He's like, we're not going to run around like the Karate Kid and skeletons like the Karate Kid, you know? Um, it's not like that. This is like secret cover up like making Tom Cruise think that he's crazy and but also silently threatening him when he goes back to the mansion and that guy hands him the note like and even that guy's look he kind of looks like Junior Soprano a little bit which is funny but this guy is intense and scary it's also a very sex driven movie there's a ton of nudity you know obviously at the party um Lots of complicated themes and, and tough questions. That's what actually makes it so gutting, I would say. 
is it has a lot of tough questions and realities about marriage. And I think that's the most gutty part of it. That's what guts you, is all the marriage realities about marriage. And the conversations that Nicole Kidman and Tom Cruise have, they're very realistic and um, eye-opening. And the crazy thing about this movie, I hadn't seen it until just a couple of years ago. I, for some reason, it was one of those movies, you know, I put off Lost in Translation, even though you kind of know they're going to be good or whatever, for some reason, you just let movies go sometimes, you'll see them later. But once I saw it, I've watched it so many times since then, it's definitely one of the greatest movies I've ever seen. You know, and it's like two and a half, close to three hour epic or whatever, so. Very sex driven, you know, Nicole Kidman at one point is in front of the mirror, there's a Chris Isaac song playing, not, uh, what is it, Baby Did a Bad Bad Thing. And man, oh man, like her body is incredible in this. But yeah, it's, whew, I'm speechless just thinking about it. That baby did a bad, bad thing, but really sticks with you. And then Tom Cruise comes in, and you're like, get out of here. But it's intense. And even Kubrick wanted to mess with Tom Cruise's mind. So there's scenes in it when Nicole Kidman's telling like a sexy story or dream or how she would like with this sailor and then Tom Cruise is driving in a cab after and he's just imagining what she told him but obviously they had to film it and like I said they were husband and wife at the time so Kubrick told the guy who was playing the sailor like really get in there and <laughs> be um, you know as close to actually doing this as possible you know to really piss Tom Cruise off and they showed him and they showed him, I'm pretty sure somewhere, where did I see or hear that they showed him the footage to fire him up? He might actually be watching the footage in the cab, like on a playback monitor. I think that's what I heard. Cruz is watching the footage in the cab on a playback monitor to get like the real reaction of some guy like feeling up his wife. Like more, like intensely. So, whew, a little intense sidebar there, but it's all part of it, it's all part of it. So, yeah, I gotta say, like, this movie shocked me. I waited a long time because I, you know, I didn't know anything about it, I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know it had anything to do with kind of these political, large-scale political things. Because that's all, it's all kind of disguised. It's very, you know, it's such, a, so good. It's really twisted. You know, it's really twisted. It's, the movie is kind of like floating through a dream because it's basically one crazy night and, and the fallout essentially afterward um, and trying to decipher that crazy night. So you're thinking, what's in his head? What's reality? He thinks he's being followed or spied on. Is he? You know, and the people that he meets along the way, it's very dreamlike. He kind of bounces around New York a little bit. He meets the prostitute and then he meets the old friend at the bar. And then he goes to the costume house and all these characters that kind of weave in and out of his crazy night. Sidney Pollock, you know, a director in his own right. Sidney Pollock's also a great actor and he's great in this. And, you know, it's his party that you go to that kind of stems everything from the beginning. And then you just know that that's Sidney Pollock when someone at the party looks at Tom Cruise because they're all wearing masks. They're all wearing those like, not even Barack masks or whatever. These are even creepier. These are like the creepiest masks you could think of. It's like they all went to like the same place. And it was like the creepy mask store and they're just like, give us what you got. And it's all faces. Like, it's all just like, Ooh. but then there's weird ones with like super long noses. All the side characters are great. So you, you know, the Russian costume salesman, apparently that guy's a, a huge European actor. Um, hey, Good boy. Um, yeah, the Russian costume salesman and Nick the piano player and everyone at the costume party is creepy. I mean, a lot of them are wearing masks and stuff like that, but everyone from the door guys to the people who walk around the house in tuxedos to the ladies, uh, the lady helping Tom Cruise out wearing a mask, naked lady helping Tom Cruise out just wearing the mask. Like, all these characters are really crazy. You know, this is really, really good movie between them. The ending is intense. Um, and Kubrick, that's three like massive powerhouses coming together in 1999, one of the greatest years in film. And uh, yeah, one of my new favorites, three hour epic. 
and the ending reminds me very much so of like a 70s ending how it just kind of cuts off it has one final line and it's a pretty uh, shocking final line so you really got to check out eyes wide shut okay coming up next we got a muppet family christmas so this is um, you can watch it on youtube it's from 1987. my family watches this movie every year it's tradition and basically and remember it's the muppet family christmas not a muppet christmas carol not a muppet bullshit a muppet family christmas it's basically non-stop jokes and one-liners it's um loose and light in the story basically the story is they all go to fozzie's mom's farm and ruin her planned vacation by surprising her um, and basically all the muppets are there then sesame street shows up and Bert and Ernie, Grover, Big Bird, The Count, um, all the sight gags. You know, you got Swedish Chef trying to cook Big Bird as the Christmas turkey. You got Kermit worried about Miss Piggy trying to arrive at the party um, in time through a snowstorm because she's at a modeling shoot and um, she needs to take a limo there. And there's a blizzard. You got Doc uh, and Sprocket, and Doc is a human character who's on vacation. His vacation is ruined by the Muppets because he arrives to Fozzie's mom's farm for like a timeshare or whatever. Fozzie's mom was going to Florida and Doc was coming there. You got an awesome scene of the Muppet Babies, uh, the video that plays on the projector where it shows them all as kids around the Christmas tree. And uh, I remember those Muppet Baby uh, Toys. I think it was from McDonald's or something like that. You can get the collection back when toys were good. You got the Fraggles living in the basement. You got Gonzo trying to get laid by a chicken. Um, and you got a turkey who's stealing the chicken away from Gonzo. It's hilarious. Um, Fozzie befriends a snowman and they start a stand-up comedy duo. And you got the two grumpy old men, Statler and Waldorf. They're top of their game in this. They're just ripping the insults in this one. Um, and all the songs that they sing in this are really beautiful. There's some traditional ones, more traditional ones, but then there's a ton that I've never heard anywhere. I've never heard them before or, or after or since. And um, they're like instant classics. I hear them, I'm just like, these songs are great. And the whole montage at the end around the Christmas tree and they're all in their little suit and ties and Christmas clothes is just so cute. It's basically a quick 45 minutes, you know? It's for kids and adults and I highly suggest it. You won't be disappointed. And I believe it's the last time we see Jim Henson alive in a Muppet movie. He's doing the dishes with Sprocket. And it's really sad and bittersweet in the end um, for that, you know, little bit of heart. He says something like, uh, well, Sprocket, it looks like they're having a really good time. Oh, that's what the holidays are all about, getting together. And uh, he's like, well, who's going to do these dishes? Someone's got to do them. And then he throws on an apron and he starts doing the dishes. It's, it's a really sweet moment and a nice, like, heartfelt, touching ending. Okay, Cooper's Christmas. Um, I think, you know, it used to be called like Cooper's Camera or Cooper's Christmas, but I think it's Cooper's Christmas, officially. And this is all over the place. You can find it on Crave TV and Prime Video. It was made in 2010, directed by uh, Warren Sonata, who I've worked with and know, and who actually may be a guest of this podcast coming up soon. He is the national director of the DGC, which means he represents all directors um, nationally. Um, and he's a well-liked individual and um, a well-deserving individual of that honor. And he's also a great director. He made this back in 2010. This movie, Cooper Christmas, it's raunchy, it's twisted, it's a bit perverted, it's no-holds-barred 1985 Christmas classic told through lost videotapes. I remember Francis um, told me about it. I believe I watched it back in the day with him he showed it to me and that in no way did i appreciate it as much as i do now so many great one-liners you know you really got to be paying attention she's like who that pervert and he's like well that pervert got me a pretty sweet deal you know there's just a lot of great one-liners a ton of sexual tension there's a ton of sexual tension between like almost every character in this for one reason or another and a lot of them are, are uh family you know so there's like a, one of the kids and his kissing cousin or whatever and then the husband and wife and then the brother and the wife and um, and then the, the sister-in-laws and the brother there's like, you know um, and one of the one of the sisters who basically I've seen this done before in other movies but one of the sisters who tricks essentially tricks someone of another culture to be their husband someone who doesn't speak English that well and yeah so a lot of sexual tension it's a very loud mouth you know it's a very loud mouth family loud especially nana the loud mouth smoky nana she just tells it like it is she's like these gifts suck just squish some some turkey under my door and she's always smoking inside 
Uh, I don't think she's wearing a wig, but it looks like she's wearing a wig and it constantly looks like it's about to fall off. And Jason Jones, you know, he's he's really the center of this. He really carries it along nicely. He's got all his dadisms. He's got the singing without knowing any lyrics. You know, once sh the bender really gets going and the shit hit really hits the fan and they all get super drunk, like it gets crazy. Um, Uncle Nick, he's a riot, you know, he's a cardboard cutout of a classic showboat for the camera, Uncle. Like as soon as he comes in, he's like, what do you got a camera? I'm a maniac, maniac. And he's, I forget what he says, but he doesn't say maniac, he even gets that wrong. So like they have no idea what they're talking about. It's very Sopranos-esque in that, you know, it's very real. It's very Trailer Park Boys too, kind of thing, you know. This, I don't know if this came first or what, 2010. Uh, so yeah, the guy Nick, he, he's a riot. Uh, that actor is just a riot. He did a really great job. Oh, so they smoke inside the house, which is really rare to see. You don't see that very often anymore. They're smoking inside the house. And you know you're into some weird shit when your drunk driving perverted rapist uncle thinks you're weird and turns his back on you. Why don't you tell him a true, like, heartfelt thing? Gord admits that he's uh, into mannequins. <laughs> And then, uh, and, and Nick kind of like, he's like, oh, I wish you were gay or something like that. And, <laughs> and then later Nick comes around, he's like, you know, I really see what you're talking about with Charlene. Um, he's really, you really got something special there. Cooper Christmas. It's a lot of fun. Super dark. Check it out. Okay. Coming up next, Serendipity. Crave TV 2001. It's one of those romantic comedies I don't mind sitting through. You got a little Eugene Levy cameo. They actually filmed portions of this in Toronto, mostly in New York, but they actually filmed portions in Toronto, and that's why you got the Eugene Levy cameo, because they're in kind of like a fancy, a more upscale, the Bay or something like that. John Corbett, so the guy from the guy who plays Eon Mueller in My Big Fat Greek Wedding. John Corbett as the over-the-top musician boyfriend of Kate Beckinsale. He's great. He's got the long hair. That stupid uh, music video they're watching. So the music video scene. You got John Corbett um, playing in a, in a field with a sitar, analyze, watching the music video with like his agent or whatever, analyzing it, and he's like asking him all the questions. Like, you don't think that Viking looks like he hates the music? So the cute thing about this is the whole whimsical idea with the glove and the book and all the, you know, just missing each other and all that and the whole chasing each other's tail. It, it's lighthearted, it's fun, it's whimsical, you know, it's magical. People want to believe in that stuff. They also want to believe in meeting cute. That's something that doesn't happen anymore. These people met over a pair of gloves in New York around Christmas time, you know. I know um, one of my cousins um, met her husband who she's been with a long time. I don't know if it was around Christmas time, at least it kind of had, it was winter at least, um, might have been Christmas time. They met at Nathan Phillips Square skating on the ice rink, right? So isn't that just a magical thing that, uh, you know, people want to believe in? So it's your old meet cute kind of story. Anyone can relate to, you want to get swept off your feet and there's just something special around Christmas that it makes it even seem so, so much extra special. Um, it's like that, you fall in love instantly and you just know. Pretty heavy hitting when he finally gets the book from his wife with Kate Beckinsale's number in it. So he's been chasing, they've been whatever, and it's kind of heavy hitting. And I like that limo scene where he just gets in the in the car. Uh, I don't know if it's limo, he just gets in the car with Piven. He's like, I found the book. It's the book, he got her number. After all that, you know, there's more magic and, and whimsical. It just, things happen. No one plays the best friend better than Piven, you know? And especially his character's arc where he's always playing the, you know, he's the best friend in the family man too. He plays that great. Um, you know, he's best friend in Entourage or whatever, you know, it just no one plays that part better than him and his character's arc when he's on the plane and he's like, you know, because his character's always like, yeah, I'm the, I'm the rock star, I'm this, I'm that, I'm so cool. And then on the plane, he's like, I'm crushed, like my wife left me or whatever, you know? So he's like, I know I play it up, but you know, I'm broken, my job sucks and you know, so it's the whole like people wear two faces. It's like social media, not everything that glitters is gold. Oh, my life's so great, my life's so great. Yeah, well, you might be crumbling behind the scenes, but... Oh, that, that obituary poem that the Pim character his, writes at the end, the metaphorical obituary, you know, talking about his friend. That's a really well-written, beautiful thing. I like that whole idea. And his voiceover nails it. Like, he did a good job. It's just a whole well-done thing. That could be like a short film on its own beautiful short film on its own. You set up the, the death of a character and, and the, that the guy's a writer and, and have that dovetail. And yeah, so they did a really good job with that. How his character dies and, you know, because essentially he's reborn. LA Confidential, neo-noir film. James Elroy, one of the great crime writers, okay? One of the greatest. 
This follows aspects of a true story based on something that was called Bloody Christmas, where seven prisoners were beaten by police officers Christmas night in 1951. So this is a period piece, LA Confidential. I couldn't find it anywhere. You have to rent it off like YouTube or Amazon Prime or something like that. You gotta pay the $4.99 or whatever for it. It's worth it. It's a great movie, great crime movie. Um, it's not super Christmas, it's little hints of Christmas. It's another LA Christmas. It's just basically your trees, your lights, your decorations, stuff like that. You know, it's Christmas, hush, hush. Eight officers from that bloody Christmas story, eight officers are indicted, 54 suspended, and 38 were transferred. So that was a huge thing. Um, it's just got a cast of great actors. You got Russell Crowe, Danny DeVito, who we mentioned earlier, another Danny DeVito Christmas movie, Kim Basinger. I think Kim Basinger either won or was nominated for an Academy Award for her role. Guy Pierce. Oh, uh, one of the best bad guy names ever. And it's kind of funny that Kevin Spacey's in this movie because he has one of the best bad guy names ever with Kaiser Soze. But one of the best bad guy names ever from this movie is Rolo Tumasi. And actually, Spacey, you know, when he's like, Rollo Tomasi. Rollo Tomasi, one of the great bad guy names ever. Um, so basically, you're following three cops in this movie on different trajectories one political, one sleazy, and one brutal. So the political one is Guy Pierce, the sleazy one is Kevin Spacey, because he takes bribes and shit on the side. He's like an undercover cop or whatever. And one brutal, which is Russell Crowe, because he'll just beat the shit out of you, kill you, beat you up with his fists, tear you apart like an animal. So it was nominated for nine Academy Awards. It won two of them, Best Actress, oh yeah, there it is. So Best Actress and Best Supporting Actress for Kim Basinger. And that was her first role in three years. She came off a three year hiatus to do that. So obviously it was well worth it and it showed. And then it also won the writing from adapted screenplay, you know, because um, it was a book first. So it's, it's about porn, corruption, exploitation. Oh yeah, David Strathairn's in it with a little porn mustache. He's a porn girl runner. Um, porn, corruption, exploitation, drugs, murder, Hollywood, you know, the perfect Christmas mix, perfect Christmas story. Ernest Safe Christmas, 1998, couldn't find this anywhere, you know, um, it should be out there, but this basically revolves around Ernest needing help from Santa to find a successor or else there'll be no Christmas. This was the first installment to feature those two wacky friends, Chuck and his brother Bobby, you know, the friends from the Ernest TV show. Um, they eventually appeared in many other movies later and were like kind of the comic relief. I think Bobby like didn't talk and Chuck talked too much or something like that. Chuck's kind of a blowhard and Bobby didn't talk, that whole gag. Um, this was the third Ernest movie and filmed during the same time as the Ernest TV show, which means Ernest was a massive hit at this time. He's filming the TV show. They're like, we got to take more advantage of this success right now. And they've went out and filmed the movie. Um, so basically Ernest gives Santa a ride for free. Um, he gets fired from his taxi ride job, taxi driver job. Santa left his sack in the back seat, and Ernest tries to hunt him down to give it back. Some high school chick, Harmony Star, shows up. Kind of sounds like a porn name, actually. And we later find out it's not her real name. Oh, one of Ernest's great disguises in this. He, Ernest has a great disguise as a snake rancher to sneak into the backlot movie studio to talk to Santa. I think Santa's on a TV show, or, or Santa's trying to talk to an actor who's on a TV show to play he wants him to be Santa going forward, um, which is kind of like a really funny and crazy idea that, you know, <laughs> Santa has to convince this guy that this, this guy now needs to be Santa. So you can see, you know, that's good conflict because you can see how someone would pull back and just be like, you're a crazy person, which is the weird thing also because it's with an Ernest movie, you think you would be, Ernest would be the one taking over Santa Claus. So obviously it wasn't a, a critical success. But it was a commercial success, and it was the highest grossing of all the Ernest films. It made $30 million on a $6 million budget. And back in the day, that's huge. That's huge profit. That's huge profit today. But it's just, there's a difference in budgets now where they're pumping. You know, maybe if Ernest was as hot as he was today back then, they'd probably make an Ernest movie for like $100 million with all the reindeer flying and all the special effects that they would want to put into it and everything to make it. And maybe it would make 300, maybe it would only make 100. So making 24 million profit on a $6 million budget movie is huge. Um, I remember the scene where Ernest needs to remember all the reindeer names really being great. He, you know, he can't get any of the names right and then he finally does and they just take off. Um, this is the only movie where Vern actually appears. I don't know if it actually shows his face, but Vern is kind of like the whole, you know, who's that guy in Wilson, the neighbor who they never show his face in Tool Time. Vern is kind of like that whole idea. 
You're like, what do you mean, Vern? Yeah, don't you think, Vern? I wonder if that's some sort of play. Because the, the actor who played Ernest, his name was Jim Varney. So I wonder if his friends called him Varn. Like, what do you think, Varn? And he just made this new character, Vern. Maybe that's a stretch, I don't know. There's enough connection there, though. The first time he did his, uh, so he has a couple great cautions. This got the snake rancher, the, the, you know, the the impression he does for that to get that guy into the movie lot, and then the anti Nelda costume for the first time pops up in this movie, where he plays like the old, his old aunt or whatever. And it's actually the only Ernest movie that doesn't have a villain, which um, is kind of refreshing, you know, because it's still a pretty solid, entertaining movie. This one's called Beautiful Girls from 1996, directed by Ted Demi, who also did another movie. I watched it, it's not as good, so I didn't put it on the list, but it's called The Ref, and it's with Dennis Leary, Kevin Spacey. I can't remember who plays Kevin Spacey's wife in it, but it just wasn't that funny. And it was by the same director. I wanted it to be good, and it's kind of a Christmas movie, but it just wasn't good enough to put it on the list. So, by Ted Demi, we're putting Beautiful Girls. And this is about a piano player, you know, midlife crisis, kind of returning home for the holidays. It's not necessarily a Christmas movie per se, but it takes place in the wintertime, so there's enough of a vibe and a feeling there, and the returning home from the holidays really m kind of makes it, turns it into that without it needing to be that. And he returns home to this blue-collar town, um, you know, and goes to see all his friends who haven't left from high school. And I think it might have been the movie that got everyone singing Sweet Caroline with the ba 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 at weddings at wherever because they do that in this movie and I don't think that they would do that after it became a thing I feel like people probably saw this movie this movie was potentially a hit in the 90s and then people started singing Sweet Caroline together the same way they do in this movie so that is my current belief unless I'm proven wrong just from the timeline of everything and uh, so if you want to see where that originated, you could see it in this movie, The Piano Player Guy. They're like, play something we know. And the guy, they're at the bar and he's playing and they all get into it. And it's actually kind of fun. I remember that's the weird thing is, and that's probably why it got overdone. Because in the movie here, it actually looks fun. And maybe it was the first time. Yeah, I don't think he'd be a fun. I don't think Ted Demi would be a follower. He's like, you know that thing that people will do at weddings where they go, bop, bop. Let's put that in the movie. So I guarantee you this was where it originated. Which is mind-blowing and huge. I remember when I saw that, I was like, what? This? This is where? This is why people do that? Directed by Ted Demi. Uh, yeah, who I said he made The Ref, but he also made Blow. Uh, he also made Blow with Johnny Depp, which is still a great movie that holds up. Blow kind of, it's not as good as Goodfellas, but it kind of floats along like Goodfellas. The funny thing about Blow is that he's like, everything was amazing everything was perfect and then it always cuts to something shitty you know every they're always on top of the world and then it just drops he's like everything was perfect and oddly enough ted demi the director of all these movies died of i believe it's a heart attack or overdose uh you know was, i think he was a heavy cocaine user and i think he was making a film about trying to get sober as well when he died something like that i don't know so there's i'll have to do some more research on that um, but he was a great filmmaker in his short career. He really was. And this this movie, Beautiful Girls, has an all-star cast. You know, Timothy Hutton, Matt Dillon, Uma Thurman, Michael Rappaport, Max Perlick, Rosie O'Donnell, Noah Emmerich. Noah, Noah Emmerich always plays the best friend movies like The Truman Show and other things like that. Good best friend character. Natalie Portman plays a kid in this. And now here's a weird little thing is Timothy Hutton is like triple her age basically or she's like maybe 13, 12 or 13 I guess or 13, 14 maybe. I don't know. I forget. I think she says it. But Timothy Hutton's like 30, mid 30s. And they kind of like there's no funny stuff but they have this weird relationship. They're neighbors and they meet and they have chats but they kind of have this weird like they fall in love a little bit. It's weird. Um, that's the strangest part of this movie, but I actually kind of like it because it takes a risk and they are not afraid to talk about it in the movie. Like the Noah Emmerich character is like, you're crazy, you know, and the guy tries to explain his reasoning for it and stuff like that. Um, so it's not like they do it and avoid it. They actually talk about it. So yeah, it's just like, it's an interesting risk to take. And somehow they manage to build this heartwarming story about friendships and relationships around it. So it's good 90s, and it's got good 90s melancholic music. You know, it's full of good 90s melancholic music and really conveys that small rural town feeling. 
um, even though it has so many big names in it. They, they pull off this small town, the wardrobe, the trucks they drive, everything, the relationships between characters, they really pull it off. Where they go to shop, all that stuff. The world is very small. And every character is very well-rounded, you know, despite their flaws. Every character has flaws in this, but they're very well-rounded. Beautiful girls. And it could, obviously, it could be a little chick flicky on the surface. You may think it's a little chick flicky on the surface, and it could be to an extent, but there's a lot of um, insightful, philosophical stuff in this. And sure, there's some fluff, but there's also a lot of realism uh, and in the conversations and the subjects. It's like an adult movie. And it, it's disguised as a chick flick movie, but it's really not. It's, it's to a sense, a guy movie, because it's following these guy characters talking about guy stuff, and there's, there's a little bit of womanly insight but it's mostly focusing on the guys that's why it's called beautiful girls it's not called beautiful girls because there's beautiful girls in it which there are but it's because these guys revolve their lives around beautiful girls that's all they can talk about that's all they can think about that's all they want but they don't know what they but they also don't know what they want it has a certain sentimental quality you know we can all feel uncertain about our careers um, the future of our careers you know the future of our relationships and we can all relate to coming back to our small hometown. So it's really got that holiday vibe to it. And finally, we've got another movie that's not necessarily a Christmas movie, but revolves around Christmas time. It takes place during the winter, and that's Mystery Alaska. So you can rent this on Prime Video for $4.99. And this is Russell Crowe as a small town sheriff in Mystery Borough, Alaska. Burt Reynolds, um, you know, Burt Reynolds is actually good in this. He, not actually good in this. He's good in a lot of things, most things. But uh, Burt Reynolds is good in this. He won an award for worst hairstyle. Actually, I think they dyed the shit out of it. It's all black. I think they've stepped... I don't know why they stepped away from... Why didn't they just let him have that kind of gray pepper, whatever? I kind of wonder if this is the birth of the outdoor game for the NHL. You know, this movie's from, like, what, 1999? Another, you know, the great year for movies. Um... I wonder if this is the birth of the outdoor game idea, because the NHL didn't start the outdoor game. They did their first Winter Classic in 2008, nine years later. And this is kind of the first outdoor game. And you got Mike Myers kind of playing this like Don Cherry-esque character. He doesn't look like him, but he kind of tries to talk like him uh, and voice like him. Uh, and so the reason why this is somewhat hovering around a Christmas movie is it takes place from mid-December through Christmas because it actually says the game is scheduled January 16th and the movie starts uh, and it says it's the game is 32 days away. They don't show any Christmas or anything like that because I think you get the rest of the whole snow. You know, we're just in, covered in snow being out in Alaska, but they actually filmed it in Alberta, which is the interesting thing. Canmore, Alberta and Banff National Park. And anyways, the schedule makes no sense. There, there's no way that these, well, now it could potentially because they got the new the winter classics and new year's day um, which is close to january 16th but back in the day there's no way this schedule would make sense i don't think the characters would be um, be able to go to alaska but who cares it's a good old-fashioned comedy about the underdog rising up to the occasion when the local hockey team gets to play the new york rangers so hank is area of simpsons fame um, you know, he brings the hockey team back there. And it's one of the two movies with mystery in the title that year, actually the star Hank is area, and the other one was Mystery Men. Um, and it, it starts off, Mystery Alaska starts off with skating on big open lake with mountains in the background, which is actually a popular thing going around social media right now that like Barstool and everyone's tweeting to Barstool, them skating on, in, on ice in like Alaska or wherever they're doing it with the mountains in the background. And it also looks like if you play any NHL 20, I think there's one thing called the peak or something like that. In NHL 3s, you play at the peak, and it kind of looks like that. So this movie was a box office flop. I don't know. I like it. I think it's pretty good. It's rated R. You know, it doesn't pander. It's like doesn't bullshit. It's rated R for a hockey movie. And, you know, they beat people up. There's It's sex, drugs, and rock and roll kind of thing. But it does have those Disney... Ment moment mentalities you know there's some heartwarming disney kind of feelings in it i think that's probably why people may assume it might be pg or something because it, it does follow that structure but it's rated r yeah so it was a critical and commercial failure 
which sucks, but I think it was a fun movie. It's directed by Jay Roach, who did the Austin Powers movies, so that's why, you know, Mike Myers was in it. And I love what Mike Myers says. Uh, he's from Flim Flom, Manitoba, or something like that. I don't know if that's a real place or whatever, but it just sounds funny. And what does he say? Mike Myers says something like, send the kids out of the room for this one. I think that Don Cherry used to say something like that, or cover their ears or whatever. And the movie's got a lot of familiar faces. You know, Kevin Durand, this is one of his first movies. The movie he did before that, Austin Powers, also directed by Jay Roach. So Kevin Durand played an assassin. I think he played one of the first Fez assassins that Will Ferrell later went on to play. But I think he played that. Um, Kevin Durand, you know, he's from Thunder Bay, Thunder Bay, Ontario. And he went on to have a great acting career. Some of the biggest movies, some with Russell Crowe, some without Russell Crowe. Um, he's like a big Hollywood movie star. And a humble dude, too. I did a movie with him in the Sioux called Edwin Boyd. Super humble dude. Just a pleasure to work with. Plays a character named Tree. Someone Tree Lane. Big tree fall hard. And you got the great Maury Chaikin. Um, dual citizenship guy. You know, born in the States, but spent a lot of his life and career in Toronto. And I know that was a huge impact to the industry when he died. He was in all these great kind of detective and crime stories and all these movies. Um, you know, from like the 90s and stuff like that. Maury Chaikin is great. He's got that speech in the courtroom about the character Tree. Um, right before Maury has his like heart attack, spoiler alert, he has a heart attack in the courtroom. He says, he plays to play. He skates to skate. He don't make a million bucks a year. He loves the game. And he dies, but he wins the courtroom battle. It's like, how can you how can you rule against that guy? Guy's so passionate, he has a heart attack and dies in the courtroom. I'd like to see that judge. He's like, eh, no peg. So he wins the thing. The New York Rangers have to go because that's the thing. The players didn't want to go, much like they're holding out right now. The players didn't want to go. This is actually the place where they invented Michael McKean's character. I think he says, what kind of fucked up bumfuck town is this? Or something, he has that line. He says it. And that's what kind of comes back to burn him in the courtroom because he's got a jury of his peers. It's all people from Alaska. And uh, they say, like, didn't you say what kind of fucked up bun fuck of a town is this? <laughs> oh, yeah. So Little Richard, this is actually a really funny moment. They bring in Little Richard to sing the national anthem and they pull like a little um, trickery. So they go in and they request Little Richard to extend the national anthem to make the Rangers players cold from just standing there freezing, standing still freezing, which is I thought that's a nice little touch. That's a funny thing. And Little Richard doing it and then so he sings the national anthem really slow and there's like a long pause and everyone wants to like start skating around and then he starts up with the canadian anthem just to extend it even further which is great the hockey action i gotta say is pretty good you know the hockey action is pretty good you got phil esposito actually who makes an announcer cameo as well and i love the little reverse psychology um, coaching wisdom Burt Reynolds kind of pulls on Russell Crowe. He's like, we got to give up. We're done. Just mail it in. You know, we got to play defense. Russell Crowe's like, we're not done. I'm not done. He fires him up, tricks him into firing him up at the end. And they come back, you know, um, close to it anyways. And so they hit the post at the end, right? It's like, it's all set up. It's, they get all their comeback goals. It's 5-4. They got the open net at the end. And Connor Banks... Uh, oddly enough, a Banks hockey player in another movie, you know, Adam Banks, Connor Banks. These guys are ultra stars. I guess your name has to be Banks to be uh, one of the best hockey players uh, in the movies anyways. So they hit the post at the end, so it's kind of bittersweet, which is, I love that, actually. You know, they lose. You know, it would be such a Disney movie if they won, but it goes with the more bad news bears mentality where they lose and you almost remember as if they won because they celebrate so much because... They only lost by a goal and they were a post away from tying it. So that means that they could keep up with the Rangers. You know, they already won. They could keep up with them. They didn't get blown out. That's essentially, you know, and it feels, that's where it kind of feels like Rocky, the underdog story. They lose, but it feels like they win. But it's a feel good story, even though they lose. Mystery Alaska, not your traditional Christmas movie, but snow filled and fun filled. And check it out. Okay, everybody, I made it through. That's the Christmas special. These are your, you know, kind of rare kind of Christmas movies. They're not going to be, I don't need to tell, like I said, I don't need to tell you to watch Home Alone and The Family Man and Die Hard and Santa Claus and Elf. You're going to watch that stuff. If you want to watch kind of your non-traditional Christmas movies with still some Christmas in them, this is what you got. All right, Yardies, see you next time.